the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44. The words of Christ, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great or greatest price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And our subject is the riches of a life knowing God. Now, the very brief first parable in these verses that we read, the man who found treasure hid in a field, well, the Lord speaks of him, probably a tenant farmer, would most likely in that land have his own small holding, but it isn't quite enough for him to make a living and to support his family. So maybe he rents an additional field nearby, at a distance, who knows? And he tills that field and works in it, and he comes across hidden treasure. It isn't so unlikely, actually. In those days, there were no safes. There were no safe places to keep things. There were many local wars and skirmishes and so on. And on many occasions, I dare say, plunder or treasure or riches had to be hidden. And the best thing to do was to wrap them up in leather, uh, keep them clean and safe and bury them deeply in some place. So it wasn't unknown. And I expect every uh, village in ancient times had a story concerning somebody finding hidden treasure. And the Lord Jesus Christ employs this in a parable. But here's the significant thing about this miniature parable. For joy thereof, he goeth and selleth all that he hath and buys that field. Don't suppose he had much. And the things he had, he set a, a value on, but they were probably relatively worthless things. But by getting everything together and parting with it, he could just about afford that field. And he bought it, and the treasure was his. What would set him up and his family and his children for life. He gave up everything he had as worthless in order to secure that treasure. And the following miniature parable is very similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And no doubt he's got quite a stock of them. He buys and sells. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. There was nothing to be compared with this, nothing equal in value. He'd never seen a pearl like it. It was so perfect and of such a size and such a quality, it was worth vastly more than all his stock and all he possessed. He'd treasured that stock, no doubt. He'd valued it. He would have been like a, a miser with that stock, reviewing it and assessing his own wealth and good fortune. But once he'd seen that pearl of greatest price, it was worthless in his estimation, all that he possessed, and he gave it up for that treasure that he'd found. And the meaning of these miniature parables is pretty obvious to all of us in the context of the New Testament, in the context of the gospel. When you discover the gospel and conversion and the life with Christ and you see your need, you consider all that God is ready to give, you give up your attachment to this world, 
you give up all your fond opinions, all your high estimation of yourself, all your old ideas, you give up everything to gain this all-surpassing treasure. That's what the parables are about. We are told repeatedly in the Gospels that the Lord Jesus Christ preached what is called in the New Testament the Gospel. He preached everywhere the Gospel. It's defined for us repentance and remission of sin. Repentance from the heart so that God can take away all the guilt of our sin and accept us and pour out his kindness and his blessing upon us. The gospel. It's also called the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom meaning the people who belong to God, who found him and come to know him. They're citizens in his kingdom. They have everlasting life. They're in the kingdom. Before we find him, we're outside the kingdom. And the treasures and the benefits and the glories and the wonders of being in the kingdom, once you see it, you'd give up anything for this. Of course, you can't earn it. Giving up things will never earn it. You cannot deserve or earn the forgiveness of God and the favor of God. But you give up and you're ready to give up the old values and the old life so that God can give you a new life and he will give it freely to you. So I'd like to look at mainly in this context, this word gospel. It translates a Greek term which means simply good news. But that's not quite enough. A, a wholly accurate translation of the term would be something like momentous news. This is the best news you could possibly have, the gospel. It is life-changing. It is momentous news momentous information or tidings. That's what the term gospel means. Now, as we go on in life, if we're relatively indifferent to God and indifferent to worship, and we've never sought him, and we've never found him, well, we wonder what this is all about. Momentous news? What can possibly be momentous news about the Christian message? about someone who came into the world, or so it is said, over 2,000 years ago. What can be so shattering, so wonderful, so momentous about this? That's what I'd like to address this evening. Oh, friends, if you only knew the treasure of what it is to know Christ, to know God, to find him, to walk with him, if you could see this, you wouldn't hesitate, like the tenant farmer, like the merchant trading in pearls, you'd give up everything to have him and to know him. You'd leave all your indifference, you'd leave all that behind. So I'm going to go through a number of things this evening. I must tell you, and I've told you before, I'm sure, that uh, as a youngster, as a Young person, I was completely indifferent to God. And it was good news to me when I first heard this. Not that I hadn't heard it before. I'd heard it many times before. I was brought up in the days when schools had regular times of worship and assemblies. And in a, uh, as a boarder at school where religion was constantly pressed upon you and the Christian faith and you had to start the day with a collect and end the day in a dormitory with a collect, with a prayer and so on. You, you had to do these things, yet nothing ever sank in. I took no interest in it, was indifferent to it. When I first really heard it with a mind or a heart somewhat prepared for it, 
It was like hearing something entirely new. I could see the value, the riches, the treasure of it. I was consumed with a great need. I could see my own utter unfittedness before God and sinfulness and almost desperation. That's what happens when you see these things and realize these things. I remember uh, when I came to the Lord myself and was converted, that hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, spoke into my heart. And I read it over and over again. And as I saw the value of what Christ had done, those words particularly hit me of Isaac Watts were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And that's the effect upon you when you see the riches, the treasure, the value of the salvation which Christ gives to those who seek him. Let me tell you, about this transformed life and its value and its riches, just very simply this evening. First of all, conversion to God is a release from captivity. That's the first thing I'd like to say about it. It is a tremendous release from captivity. Before we seek and find Christ for ourselves and experience conversion, we are captives. Oh, we don't think of that. No, no, I'm free to think. I'm not a religious person, we say. I'm not changed to that. We get it completely the wrong way round. We say I'm not limited and bound to follow some religious uh, uh, rules and worship and ceremonies. I am free. I am free to form my own views, my own opinions, to follow my own ambitions, my own desires, to do what I want and how I want, to form my policy for life, to decide what I'm going to do in life. I am free to live within reason in any number of different places I can choose. I am a free person. No, says the Bible, you are a captive. You are in captivity. First of all, you're in captivity to the way you've been brainwashed. In this present society, you have been brainwashed to believe there is no God. You've been brainwashed against all your natural instincts, an inner instinct from earliest life told you about God, but you've been brainwashed to have contempt for that. I remember a young man coming up to me, a very big built, tall young fellow, and he said somewhat pompously, he said, there is no evidence whatsoever for a God. I was touching on this a week ago. There is no evidence whatsoever for a God, he said. What made him say that? He was brainwashed. Evidence is all around you. What is the explanation for us, for people, with our degree of sophistication and our feelings, our emotional systems, our minds, our powers of reason, our will, our liberty of will. How do you account for us? Except that there is a spiritual creator being even greater than we are who also thinks and feels and has vast intelligence who created us in this world, in this setting with all its wonders and detail. Dear friends, the evidence is everywhere. Oh no, the young man had been convinced by militant atheism that life can come from nothing, that life can just form 
from something completely lifeless, that the chemistry can so work under the right conditions that life can be formed. But even as he believed all that, he was forgetting something. There's no evidence for that at all. There's not the tiniest spark of evidence for that. In this world, the simplest organism imaginable is very complex and it exists with a whole bundle of information that determines how it will develop, how it will re reproduce, what it will look like at maturity, how it will do this, how it will do that, all its internal processes. Where does that complexity of information come from? Oh, they now say it must have come from another solar system, which is a way of saying, yes, we agree. There is absolutely no evidence for it in ours. And then you've got them on the run. But the person who says, oh, there's no evidence, he's been programmed to say that. He's been brainwashed to think that. You're in captive. You're captive to all this type of thing. And conversion delivers you from that. It shows you real reality. You open your eyes. You're captive to being a very limited person with a very limited life. And I'll tell you how. This is the captivity you need to be delivered from. Why? You're only flesh and blood. You're only operating at the physical level. Your soul is not functioning. You have no interaction with the living God. You have no sight or understanding of spiritual things, of the plan of God. You don't have your prayers answered. You don't have any action or experience spiritually at all. You're only a portion of a person. You're only flesh and blood and bones and so on. The spirit isn't there. And you're trapped in that. Conversion sets you free from that. And the whole of you can operate. And you live life on an entirely different level. And you walk with God and you know him. And you're going to him. Now you've got freedom. Freedom from limitation. From captivity. From being a total materialist. With nothing outside that little capsule of materialism. So conversion is first and foremost a being set free from captivity. You're captive also to sin. You're a sinner. We're all sinners by nature and by choice. And you're captive to that sin. You know you are. Without conversion, you know there are sins you cannot conquer and you cannot do anything about them. And in your better moments, you wish you could and you've tried. And how you wish you wouldn't lose your temper if that's your problem. How you wish you wouldn't be so selfish if that's your problem. How you wish sometimes you wouldn't be so deceitful and tell lies so easily if that's your problem. Whatever is your main problem or your weakness, you know that that sin has you in its clutches and you're worse than you were five years ago, not better. You're a captive to the life of sin and unbelief and alienation from God and you can't get out of it. And don't you see, the gospel is like treasure hidden in the field the pearl of great price. Here suddenly is a message. You can be released. You can be forgiven. You can be accepted by God. He will work in your heart and make you a new person and break the power of sin. And he will relate to you and make you his child and make you a citizen of the eternal kingdom. And that's the best news that you could possibly have, release, escape from captivity. Oh, dear friends, you're captive to purposelessness. 
Your life without God has no great eternal purpose. Your purpose is to fix on certain earthly ambitions. If I could get that promotion, if I can get that house, if I can get that experience, and you get it, and you have it, and that's done, that's past and gone, and your heart is empty again, what's next? You've got to fill up your expectations with something else, something new. And so you go on, and it's expensive too. And you go through life, if you can, moving from one supposed high to another. But really, you've got no ultimate purpose. And sometimes it comes over you, what is my life for? You may say to yourself, I love my husband, I love my wife, I've got no grandchildren, and so on. But what is life really for? What if I lost my life tomorrow? What would it all have been in aid of, apart from just making good in this material world for a short time? That purposelessness, you're captured by it. You're captive to it. Conversion releases you from that. No wonder Charles Wesley, and he was a clergyman, but he wasn't converted. It was all theory to him. But then he began to seek the Lord, and he was converted. And what does he say? Well, in one of his greatest hymns, the verse runs, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart went free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's the reality. It's a release from all that holds you back and holds you down and keeps you from heaven and unbelief as well a relief from captivity you could add to that it's a release from darkness before you convert it you don't understand you don't understand about God you don't understand his nature you don't understand his loving kindness you don't understand his plan for the world you don't understand the future things that will take place you don't understand yourself, that you're a sinner and that you're lost. You don't understand human nature. Why, look around. People, even some of our leading politicians, if they're not converted, they don't understand human nature. They don't understand the fall and the depravity of men, men and women. That's why so many things will never work, can never be put right. You're in darkness. You don't understand. When you're converted, God shines a light into your soul and into your mind, and you see it all, and you understand yourself, and why you're here, and what God expects of you, and how you need him, and how he can forgive you, and what Christ has done. Oh, you understand that, how Christ came from heaven into this world, to suffer and to die on Calvary's cross, to take the punishment on their behalf of all those who would repent of their sin in the history of the world. You understand it. You see why? Why did Christ have to come? Because God cannot forgive us. Just like that. He cannot forgive us. He is too holy and too just. He must punish sin. He came himself, the second person of the triune Godhead, to take that punishment for us. That is astonishing. That is the most precious thing any human being can learn and hear of, that Christ, who is God, equal with the Father, came to die for a creature like me, to take my punishment so that I could go free and be his child. That's so valuable 
and so precious to have him and to have his salvation and to have him take over my life. Why, I give up anything for that. All the foolish things that I valued, all the sins that I've wanted to keep, Lord, take them away, I'll say, just to have Christ and his saving love in my life. Time is going on, friends. This is a release from exclusion. Exclusion from what? Exclusion from God's attention. Exclusion from heaven. Exclusion from the kingdom of God. Conversion is a release from a state of exclusion. Put it this way. When it comes to God's kingdom, am I an outsider or an insider? Have I tasted it? Have I been brought into it? Do I understand it? Do I relate to God? Can I approach him? Does he bless me? Do I walk with him? Do I experience answered prayer? Do I have his understanding? Or am I an outsider looking at a building from the outside? I wonder what it's like in there. I wonder what happens in there. The, the doorman wouldn't let me in. I don't belong there. I don't work there. I don't live there. I'm an outsider, shut out. I have no idea what happens in that place. If I'm excluded from God and from the kingdom of heaven, I know nothing of the riches of walking with Christ and the value of having him and the wonder and the way he guides and blesses his people. I don't know their happiness. I don't know their inner peace. I have to scrape up what happiness I can from this materialistic world. I don't know any deep happiness, spiritual happiness. I'm outside. Conversion brings you in. It delivers you from exclusion from God and exclusion from his kingdom. It's so precious, so valuable. It releases you from something else. A short life. Without God, that's all we've got. A short, uncertain, earthly life. It flies so quickly. And I can tell you, it goes faster and faster. Youth goes almost as soon as it started. Middle age doesn't take long. You get to 60, the years start to fly. In your 70s, they fly even faster. In your 80s, where I am, they go so quickly. I find myself often saying, no, that happened about five years ago. No, says somebody else, you're wrong. It was 20 years ago. The more you go on, the faster life flies. And then you're sick. And it's a final sickness, perhaps. And you're infirm. And you're gone. Like a summer's flower, we flourish, blows the wind, and it is gone. A short, short life. What have you done with it? What have you accomplished? No, 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 not just material things. Eternal things. Nothing. You're converted. You are released from a short life. You will never die if you're converted. When the light of this world goes out, the light of the next will come on and you'll be in the eternal glory. If you've found the Lord, there'll be so many people there who prayed for you, who were the Lord's people, and they're there to welcome you. And you'll see Christ and the angels and the sights 
will be unimaginable. And the glory and the praise, and you'll know all things, and you'll be filled with an unbelievable happiness and joy. Conversion releases you from a short life and gives you eternal life. That's the promise of Christ, life everlasting. And I say, and I must come to conclusion, conversion will release you from a very costly life. Everything costs. Everything has to be paid for. Every sin has to be paid for. Every earthly experience costs you money or something, energy, effort, exhaustion. It's such a costly life. It wears you out and takes so much from you. It delivers you from a costly life and brings you into a life, let's call it a life of grace. Do you know what grace means, friends? It means undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor from God. You receive so much freely from God, forgiveness of all your sin, a new nature, a new mind, a new outlook, a new destiny, a new future, the guidance of the Lord. You receive so much and you receive it freely. Christ has deserved it for you. He's paid for it for you. He's atoned for your sins. He's given his perfect righteousness to purchase eternal life for all who come to him. So you're delivered even from a very costly life and experience. Without Christ, it's a life with many disappointments, many setbacks. You are subject to good or bad fortune, every possible accident and mishap. Everything could hit you, or anything. But with Christ, you're in his hands. He permits you only the things which he gives you strength to bear and live through. He's your kindest coach and friend and guide imaginable. You really know him and you'll never give him up. So I must sum up. Conversion is a release from captivity. Conversion is a release from ignorance and darkness. Conversion is a release from exclusion from the kingdom of God and from Christ's attention. Conversion is, is deliverance from a short life into an eternal life. And conversion is a deliverance from the costly life into a life where so many things are freely given to you of God. All you have to do is repent of your sin and believe in Christ with all your heart and value him and his amazing kindness and love in suffering and dying for sinners and ask him for life and hand over the old life. Lord, I give you my worthless life and all my sin and failure and all my foolishness and all my cynicism and godlessness I give it up and I hand it over. Lord, take me and reshape me and make me thine own. And he does, and he will. Where's your life, friends? You all know about the sword of Damocles. We all had to learn about him at school. Dionysius the king of a city in Sicily and all its surrounding villages. And he had a courtier. It's a Roman legend. Never really happened. But it has a message. 
and he had a courtier named Democles. And he one day flattered the king. What a great person he was. And he added this, you must be so happy and so secure and so blessed and so much at peace with yourself. Well, that wasn't the experience of Dionysius. Every day he was frightened for his life. He constantly feared that somebody else, some usurper, would come and kill him and take his position and his luxury and his grandeur. So he trembled day by day. And he was very annoyed when Damocles, his courtier, told him how fortunate he was. So he arranged for Damocles to sit on a throne like his own and to be waited on hand and foot and pampered day and night just to see how he felt. And Damocles was thrilled. He was so pleased to be in that position until he noticed something else that the king had done. Dionysius had suspended above his head a sharp sword you know the story, hanging on a single tiny thread of horsehair. At any moment, it could come down and execute him. And Damocles very soon gave up the idea of being on that throne and pleaded to be let back to his former life. What a description sometimes of us. I've loved this world, we say. I've disregarded God. I'm all for the here and now. I can be a happy and a great and a good person without any God. I'm against him. I don't want him. Life hangs by a thread, dear friends. And that thread could break. And you're in the presence of God and you're confronting the judge of all the earth. And God will give you the desire of your heart. He will say to you, you wanted nothing to do with me. You wanted me out of the way. You thought you'd take a chance on there being a judgment and you'd pay that price just to get rid of me and to spurn me and to slander me and to oppose me. Your choice was not to have me. That'll be your eternal future. You will not have me. You will go to your judgment. You will be given your vote, your decision, your life was your decision. You didn't want God. And God will honor exactly what you wanted. That thread will give way. And what a fool. What a fool. What a tragedy. When to know Christ was the greatest treasure imaginable. Come to him, friends. Waste no time. Come to him, pray to him, give yourself to him, repent of your sin, trust in him and him alone, that he will save and convert you. Let's pray. O oh Lord, look upon us all and help us. Bless us this night. Forbid it, O oh Lord, that we should go away to disregard thee and to live only for now. Lord, help us and move in our hearts and bless each one. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.